couple days ago, we talked about refraction. We defined it as the bending of light. Uh, we defined a term in the context of refraction. We said the index of refraction is really how much light bends. It's a measure of how much light bends. The bigger the number, the more light bends. But technically, it's defined as the ratio of the speed of light in a vacuum to the speed of light in whatever medium it is that you're dealing with. So we're going to say n, the index of refraction of medium x, is the speed of light in a vacuum, which of course is always 3.00 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, divided by the speed of light in medium x. Now, that's not an equation that's on your data sheet. It is an equation that's useful to know. But really, it comes down to the definition, right? If you remember, the definition is the ratio of the speed of light in a vacuum to the speed of light in whatever medium, then you can derive the equation yourself. It's going to be C over V. Ratio is always division, right? Ratio always means divide. So it's going to be C divided by V. Now, every material has its own index of refraction. They're all different, for the most part at least. We did a demonstration the other day where the index, we found the index of refraction of Pyrex glass was the same as the index of refraction of baby oil. Generally, they all have their own unique index of refraction. In fact, they, own have, they all have their own unique indices of refraction, more than one index of refraction. A piece of glass has essentially an infinite number of indexes of, or indices of refraction, and that's based on the wavelength of the frequency of the EMR that's going through it. Red light doesn't have an index of refraction. It's light but it causes an index of refraction for glass. Violet light doesn't have an index of refraction, but it causes a different one for glass. The index of refraction of glass for red light is different than it is for violet light. And that's what causes the light to split up, to disperse, as we saw on Tuesday, on Monday, I should say, as we saw on Monday, when we were talking about this phenomenon called dispersion. Take a look at this diagram here. Tell me which color, not which color has the highest index of refraction, but which color produces the highest index of refraction in this glass. What would it be? Red or probably going to be red or violet, right? right? One of the two extremes. Which one's it going to be? Highest index of refraction of glass for red light or for violet light, and how do you know? John? How do you know? Good. If we said the index of refraction is a measure of how much light bends, and we get light bending more with violet light, then the glass must have a higher index of refraction for violet light than it does for red light. Does that make sense? That means that higher frequencies produce higher index of refraction. Lower wavelengths produce higher indices of refraction. All right. We then talked about an equation called Snell's Law. And this is what you worked on yesterday when I wasn't here, Snell's Law. It provides for us the relationship numerically between the angle as it goes into a medium and comes out of the medium, theta 1 and theta 2, the speed. Okay, we know the speed changes. In fact, that's why the angle changes, because the speed changes. The wavelength, which also changes because of the speed, and the indices of refraction the material that it's coming from, the material that it's going to, which of course is what causes ultimately all of this to happen, the, the speed to change, and therefore the angle and the wavelength to change. Okay, complicated looking equation, you only ever need to use two parts, one and two, one and three, one and four, two and four, and so on and so on and so on. Okay, write down your givens, solve for what you're looking for. We left you yesterday with uh, a podcast when I wasn't here, and uh, we described how to solve these problems. But we have to have some questions that uh, we didn't have an opportunity to go over, obviously, because, because I wasn't here. Um, page 668, any issues with those questions on page 668? They're all good? Go to page 670. They were all good, too? Excellent. Once we finished this bit of refraction and Snell's Law, uh, you saw a little bit of a podcast yesterday on total internal reflection. The idea with total internal reflection is that light will, light will sometimes, instead of refracting, 
reflect. Now, if a beam of light comes in like this from a low index of refraction to a high index of refraction, maybe it's going from, let's say, air to glass. Maybe it's going from water to diamond, whatever the case may be, from a low index of refraction to a high index of refraction. We know in that case, if you're going increasing n, then that's going to decrease v. Right? n goes up, v goes down. Lambda also goes down, and theta also goes down. That means theta 1 that we have right here will be bigger than theta 2. The angle of refraction, theta 2, will be smaller than theta 1 because theta is going down as a result of n going up. We can increase the angle of incidence, however, like this. Make theta 1 bigger. When we make theta 1 bigger, theta 2 is going to get bigger, but it's still going to be smaller than theta 1. We can increase it even more. Theta 1 is huge now, 85 degrees, let's say. That's going to make theta 2 even bigger. It's going to make theta 2 pretty big, but it's still going to be less than theta 1. It's always going to look something like this. The line is always bending toward the normal line because V is always decreasing, lambda is always decreasing, and therefore theta is always decreasing when the index of refraction is going up. But when you've got it the other way around, flipped over, and you've got a high index of refraction, going to a low index of refraction. Maybe this time you're going from water to air. The example that I gave you with water and air yesterday was the fish in the pond, right? You back up, you couldn't see. Remember that, guys? I think I gave you that one on the podcast, right? You back up, you couldn't see the fish in the pond. It disappeared. Did you guys see that? Was it a golf ball? Okay. Some, some years it's a golf ball, some years it's a fish. Okay. Um, when you're going from water to air, or glass to air, or a high index of refraction to a low index of refraction, n is going down. As n goes down, well then, v is going to go up. As v goes up, lambda goes up. And as v and lambda go up, theta also goes up. That means that this ray is going to bend away from the normal line. Theta 2 is going to be bigger than theta 1. If we increase theta 1 even more, Theta 2 gets bigger still. If we increase theta 1 even more, I'm using red for a reason here, okay, theta 1 is even bigger, then maybe theta 2 actually becomes 90 degrees. Maybe the light skips along the boundary between the two different materials, the two different media here. This is what we call the critical angle. It's a critical angle here. An angle of incidence that we call the critical angle because that's where something different starts to happen. That's where a phenomenon called total internal reflection begins to occur. Anything above that critical angle, the ray of light doesn't refract. The ray of light reflects. It bounces off. And now it's the law of reflection that holds. Now it's not theta 1 being a certain value, theta 2 being a different value by Snell's law. Now theta 1 is equal to theta 2. Okay, this angle, this angle right here is equal to this angle right here because it's just reflection. Now, how do we find the critical angle? Well, the critical angle occurs, you can see in this diagram, when the angle of refraction theta 2 is 90 degrees. So let's go back to Snell's law. Sine theta 1 over sine theta 2 equals, at least let's look at, look at part of Snell's law, n2 over n1, and let's set theta 2 equal to 90. Sine 90 will always be equal to 1. So this just disappears when you're looking for the critical angle. We're going to change the equation into sine theta c is equal to n2 over n1. Or it could be v1 over v2 or lambda 1 over lambda 2. Usually it's n2 and n1, though. Solve for theta c. Okay, it's the inverse sine of n2 over n1. You get that value, anything above that critical angle, refraction occurs, anything below that angle, refraction occurs. Hey, good news, a lot of people will mix up, this isn't good news, a lot of people will mix up n2 and n1. Okay, they'll flip them over. Instead of saying, going from a high to a low index of refraction, okay, 
2.4 index of refraction to 1.0 index of refraction. They go the other way around, 1 to 2.4. The good news part of that is that if you do that, your calculator gives you an error. So if you flip those over by mistake, in a, not in a regular Snell's Law problem, but in a critical angle problem, if you flip these over by mistake, okay, then you're going to know it because you're going to get an error on your calculator, and you know to try again, right? It's an easy mistake to make, but it's not one that's going to cause you to get a multiple choice question wrong because, you know, the nasty people that write these questions aren't going to be able to put the answer you get. You're not going to get an answer. All right. I left you with a couple of questions on critical angle on page 673. Three questions, actually. One question, three parts. Any issues with that? I'm sorry? 